So good morning, Lakeshore family. Uh, Remy sir, Dr. Jandi sir, Harry sir, Sadhmo sir, all senior dancers, colleagues, friends. Today we will be having a breakfast CME, the new concepts in the management of dietary food. And we will be having four, spe uh, four speakers, Dr. Rahul Walsaraj, Dr. C. B. Isaac, Dr. John Jakanamali and Dr. Ajay Simon. And the session will be chaired by Dr. Lasa Chandi and Dr. Anand Kumar. So invite the speakers and the chairpersons to come on stage and start the proceedings. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, today, I think uh, we have the administration represented by the director, Dr. Shamesh. Uh, today's uh, topic of discussion is very important because that is is taking over our community in a very fast and dangerous way. Uh, to enlighten us about the uh, modern aspects of uh, diabetes, uh, there are a panel of four. I request Dr. Rahul Varsaraj to start off the proceedings with uh, the endocrine perspective of diabetes. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, respected chairpersons, and uh, good morning, senior faculty. So, I'll be speaking on the endocrine perspective of diabetic food. So, be it cultural beliefs, or when we go to a place of religious worship, be it our homes, or even sometimes in the OPD, uh, barefoot walking is something which is deeply engraved in us and uh, we commonly do see this and for a patient with diabetes this can lead to grave consequences. So why is it important to evaluate the food in a patient with diabetes? So the data says that food complications are one of the most common causes of diabetic related hospitalizations. Diabetic foot ulcer can affect around 25% of patients with diabetes. And of course, the cost is four times higher for a patient with diabetic foot compared to a patient without. And it is the most common cause of non-traumatic amputations. So this is a very good slide. It shows the five-year mortality of different cancers and also people with diabetic foot. So if you look at chart codes and diabetic foot ulcer, it has a higher five year mortality than breast cancer. Patients with patients who have had minor amputations, patients with critical limb tissue ischemia and major amputations have a higher risk of mortal, five year mortality compared to that of all cancers put together. So coming to the pathophysiology, I think most of us know that it is due to both sensory neuropathy, that is peripheral neuropathy and also peripheral arterial disease. So with regard to peripheral neuropathy, you have sensory, motor and autonomic neuropathy, which leads to loss of protective sensation. Again, it can cause dry skin, altered blood flow and also the wasting of muscles can lead to altered joint mobility. And this leads to repetitive trauma, abnormal plantar pressure and callus formation and finally leads to the formation of diabetic foot, that is diabetic foot ulcer. And also in turn peripheral arterial disease can also cause the same. So most commonly what we see is neuropathic and neuro ischemic ulcers which constitutes around 90% of the diabetic foot ulcers and around 5%, 5 to 10% is uh, due to pure ischemic ulcers. So when we look at the risk factors, apart from diabetes, the diabetes control and the diabetes duration, peripheral arterial disease, your microvascular complications, a patient with chronic kidney disease, patients with diabetic retinopathy and of course aging can also cause, uh, it, it, it leads to a higher risk of having diabetic foot ulcers and apart from that you have local causes that is your neuropathy, that is foot deformity, callus formation. Patients who have had a previous ulcer, 
if you have if you have had a previous diabetic foot ulcer in the next one year you are around 40% higher risk of having another ulcer improper footwear and also limited joint mobility can lead to foot ulcers so in our busy op we can we can do something really quickly that is a 3 minute foot examination which can be done for all patients with diabetes so that consists of history taking that is you have to ask the patient which can which you can take around 1 minute examine the patient and also then we need to classify the diabetic foot and educate the patient so when we look at the history of course we need to ask regarding the duration and the control of diabetes we need to ask regarding neuropathic symptoms which can constitute positive negative symptoms that is either numbness tingling pins and needles uh, slipping of chapels from your feet all those things we can ask for then of course you have vascular symptoms that is intermittent claudication and rest pain and if the patient has a previous history of chronic kidney disease or retinopathy and of course past history of previous ulcers foot deformities and amputations and also an important history to ask is regarding the antibiotic use previous antibiotic use for any foot ulcers personal history of course is important occupational history is also very important because certain occupations many pa patients do walk barefoot especially temple priests even patients are uh, farmers all these people do walk barefoot so when we come to the examination the most important again the initial assessment is the gait when the patient the patient walks into the opd whether what is the type of gait that they have is it like a st high high stepping gait is it a stamping gait is the patient dragging the feet is the patient coming on a wheelchair so so many things we need to check and specific for examination the skin the skin is important because you get many signs such as dryness loss of hair again which tells us about autonomic neuropathy if there is any redness cracks and fissures callus or corn and also it's important to check the web space for web space mycosis or infections we look at the nails we have different types of nails which we can see in patients with diabetic foot uh, nail fungal infections ingrown nails uh, thickened nails or the ram horn nails onycholysis where the nail separates from the nail bed and also you have the paronychia the infected nails and then we have the deformities you have hallux valgus you have the hammer toe you have the claw toe the mallet toe and also if there are prominent metatarsals heads or pes cavus and uh, you can also see the rocker bottom uh, foot that is the charcot's foot also you can see and if there is muscle wasting or not examination of footwear is definitely important what kind of footwear the patient is wearing and you see a lot of footwear different types of footwear which are very good to look at but it can be really tight as in a, especially there are ones which are very narrow so that can lead to the crowding of the toes which can lead to ulcers so we need to educate the patients regarding the footwear also so if you look at the high risk areas for diabetic foot ulcer you have the tip of the toes the metatarsal head and the heel and uh, the crowding of the toes the the medial and the lateral side of the toes you can have ulcers if you have tight footwear on on the on the dorsal aspect also you can have uh, ulcers and also if you have flat foot you can have on the midfoot region so if we, when we come to the neurological examination apart from the full examination it will be difficult to do so the basic examination which we can do for diabetic foot is uh, the ankle reflexes and also the mono filament test that is a 10 10 g mono filament test so the new guidelines says that only three sites need to be checked but there are some other guidelines which says there are five sites six sites 10 sites even so if any of the two sites uh, the patient cannot appreciate that means there is loss of protective sensation and then there's also the tuning fork test uh, which we can keep on the distal phalanx of the great toe 
uh, if the patient is appreciating that or not and another thing which is again routinely done in our hospital is the vibration perception threshold or the biotisiometer where with the electric uh, electric you put the different kinds of volts so different amplitude of vibration is uh, is transmitted through this machine and it is kept on the different sides of the legs and we see whether the patient is able to appreciate or not so again this is also similar to the vibration that is a tuning fork test so that also helps us in detecting loss of protective sensation and if you don't have any of these equipment available you can do the hip switch touch test so with the tip of your finger the index finger you can touch the three toes that is the first toe the third toe and the fifth toe and if the patient is able to appreciate more than more than two sides that means it's positive if the patient cannot appreciate two sides or more that means there is loss of protective sensation and the basic vascular examination that is the feeling of the peripheral pulses the ankle brachial index and also there is a toe systolic pressure or the toe brachial index in especially ankle brachial index sometimes if there is calcification it might be falsely high or normal so the toe toe brachial index might be a little bit better and of course there is something like the capillary refill time also which we can check and then there is probe probe to bone test which is to check if there is osteomyelitis or not so we put a sterile probe uh, into the ulcer to feel for a grittiness that is if the bone is exposed or not so if the bone is if you can feel the grittiness that means there is highly likely that the patient will have osteomyelitis so after this history and examination then we need to classify the foot so is the patient having a high risk foot a moderate risk low risk or very low risk and depending on the classification we will educate the patient and we will we'll decide the frequency of follow up again basic investigations which we can do is of course the blood investigations to check the, if there is any signs of infection the glycemic status and the renal status and cultures need to be taken we can do an x-ray for osteomyelitis or if there is charcot and also then we can move to doppler and then there are other investigations i'm sure which our next speakers will uh, deal with so coming to the treatment from an endocrine side if it is a mild infection we can continue the oral anti diabetic drugs if it is moderate to severe of the glycemic status is very poor it is better to switch over to insulin and especially in hospital patients it is better to go for a basal bolus regimen if there are any risk factors of course we need to manage that and if you are looking at glycemic targets especially the patient in the opd we need to target a fasting of 90 to 130 a pp postprandial plasma glucose of less than 180 and hba1c of less than 7 however again we need to choose the patient correctly if it's a very elderly patient with multiple comorbidities we will have less stringent targets a hba1c of maybe 7.5 also is okay and in in hospital the patient is admitted our glycemic targets need to be between 140 and 180 so infections again are divided into mild moderate and severe then severe so this is the idsa classification and depending on if it is mild moderate or severe we'll choose whether we'll give oral or injectable antibiotics so from this different data available so compared to the western data the indian data shows that we have mainly a polymicrobial uh, infection which is seen in these foot ulcers and mainly gram negative is predominant and if you look at the the organisms isolated uh, you have staph aureus pseudomonas enterococcus faecalis you have e coli and klebsiella some other studies uh, says that e coli is more common than pseudomonas so different studies have shown different data so what are the issues with antibiotics so we have most of the patients who come with us are the ones which come with chronic ulcers and there is also rampant use of empirical antibiotics without cultures patients who have received multiple course of antibiotics and also because of this you have multi drug resistance 
So if you are looking at mild infections, infections which are superficial without ischemia, in such cases if it is an acute which is you, we don't see it more, more very commonly. So if it is an acute ulcer without previous antibiotic exposure mainly we, it will be probably a gram positive uh, organism. So we use the older generation penicillins and cephalosporins. If there is recent antibiotic exposure probably you need to have more broad spectrum antibiotic coverage. If the patient is allergic to beta lactam, so you can give clindamycin or doxycycline and if there is a higher risk of MRSA then you can give linozolid, clindamycin and cotrimoxazole. If it is a moderate to severe infection, patients with deep ulcers, patient with foul smelling ulcers and uh, pus formation, if there is signs of SIRS, so in such cases you will need to give a bo more broad spectrum antibiotic because it will be polymicrobial both gram positive and gram negative with anaerobes. So if there are no other complication, complicating features you can give amoxiclav, you can give second or third generation cephalosporins, patients who have had recent exposure to antibiotics you can give piperazine, tazobactam, ceftriax or ertapenem. If it is an ischemic, if it is a necrotic ulcer with uh, gas formation, foul smelling ulcer, you need to give coverage for anaerobes also. So you add a clindamycin to a third generation cephalosporin. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And the duration of antibiotics will be one to two weeks and if it is moderate to severe, it will be two to four weeks. And just the last slide, so if this just a slide on charcoals, acute charcoals, there is some data on increased bone turnover and use of bisphosphonate. So the evidence is there for pamidronate, alentronate and zolindronate. And uh, if there is a reduced act, in acute charcoals using these agents can decrease the temperature, decrease the pain and bone turnover markers also. So finally the cornerstones of prevention is to identify the food at risk, patient education, appropriate footwear and treatment of the risk factors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahil. I think you have very well covered the uh, medical and diabetic aspects. I think uh, uh, we'll <coughs> cover that uh, or we'll start asking these questions. Last, okay. okay. Now I invite Dr. CBI said to discuss about the role of endovascular interventions. Very important because uh, as we know diabetic foot is caused by all these four combinations. That is a poorly controlled diabetes, peripheral neuropathy, and infections and uh, vascular, low vascularity. So uh, previously we, I remember in my BBS days and uh, house urgency days we used to get uh, only, the only solution for diabetic foot was just to keep on doing debridements and higher and higher amputation till we uh, uh, get the highest level where there is vascularity. But now we have a lot of interventions available and Dr. CP will uh, tell about it. Thank you. Prospective chairpersons, senior colleagues and dear friends, Today I am going to talk on the role of endovascular revascularization for critical limb ischemia and diabetic foot. Limb ischemia can be either acute with less than 2 weeks duration or chronic with more than or equal to 2 weeks duration. There is a newer term called critical limb threatening ischemia which includes advanced peripheral artery disease with rest pain, absent or diminished pulses, gangrene or ulceration of more than or equal to 2 weeks duration. And there is definitely a role for conservative treatment in uh, this kind of patients. You control the risk factors like smoking, diabetes and treatment of infection. Aspirin, silostazole and low dose rivaroxaban plus statin. And with conservative treatment only, leg salvage rate is low. And critical limb tattering ischemia, the risk of limb loss is very high, if not revascularized, approximately 40% by 6 months and peripheral arterial disease is the only independent prognostic factor for amputation. And revascularization helps to treat the hemodynamically significant stenosis, minimize tissue loss and decrease the risk of amputation and subsequently decrease mortality. And the decision to revascularize depends on the Wi-Fi classification system which includes and the extent of the, extent of the wound, the severity of ischemia and the level of foot infection and the ischemia uh, whether it is a complex ischemia with a 100% occlusion 
whether any calcification, uh, what is the visibility of the distal vessel. And we have to consider the patient related factors also, like patient's renal status, the possibility of diagnosis, nephropathy, bleeding risk, ambulatory status of the patient, and life expectancy. And uh, for wound healing, direct inline pulsatile uh, blood flow with pressure head is required to the site by the wound related artery. It is not just collateral blood supply which helps to uh, uh, heal the wound. And uh, the open artery should ideally supply the wound related angiosome which consists of the skin, subcutaneous tissue, the fascia, the nerves, muscles and up to the bones. And if you can't open the wound related artery, at least one tibial artery should be patent. The reasons are not every wound is confined to a single angiosome space. There are perforating metatarsal branches connecting dorsal and plantar vessels and if the distal most wound related artery is diffusely diseased, additional supply through pedal and perineal branches are very important. And the modes of revascularization, five-year clinical outcomes of endovascular procedures and surgery are the same. Angioplasty is the preferred in most patients as it is minimally invasive, has low morbidity and mortality, it decreases the length of hospitalization and has a success rate of more than 90%. And pedal bypass surgery results are not as great as we think mostly distal target vessels are usually small and calcified and long-term patency is better with surgery. A primary goal is wound healing, long term patency is a secondary goal. And management of critical limb ischemia is, uh, requires a multidisciplinary team approach which ta starts in the diabetic foot clinic measuring the angle brachial index which, is, uh, which tells us the severity of the ischemia. The radiologist doing the arterial doppler uh, which uh, gives the, um, uh, uh, the level of ischemia. The interventional cardiologist or radiologist doing endovascular procedures podiatric surgeon or orthopedician doing the wound debridement and subsequent care and sometimes plastic surgeon help also required. Regarding the arterial axis, uh, usually we go by the common femoral artery, either anti-grade or retrograde. Usual approach is a contralateral femoral artery and uh, we go uh, using a crossover sheet across the uh, aortic bifurcation to the opposite artery. And when the wound is uh, at the angle of the foot, sometimes catheters may not reach from the opposite groin. So we have to puncture the ipsilateral leg and go anti-gradely. And when the common femoral artery is diseased, we have to puncture the distal SFA and go retrogradely. We will re review some of the cases. This is a case of diabetes with non-healing ulcer, very bad ulcer you can see. And uh, if you see the angiogram, the posterior uh, tibial artery is patent. The distal anterior artery is 100% occlusion, there is no dorsal spitus artery. So we have special wires to open 100% occlusions and this uh, passed and uh, ballooned and finally get a good result, the, uh, the dorsal spitus artery is open and the full arch is formed. And uh, this is the kind of uh, healing, the, a lot of granulation tissue uh, and the wound is in the healing phase. This is another case, 75 year old male with non-healing ulcer right foot and it's a post ABG, diabetes, hypertension, reformed smoker. These kind of patients have almost all the risk factors. They have all comorbidities. Most of them are diabetes with the smoking habit. And uh, Doppler showed monophasic blood flow. And this, there's a total occlusion in the superficial femoral artery. A lot of calcification. Uh, nothing, no flow here. And uh, in the leg also no flow. Poor flow distally. And because of heavy calcification, normal balloons won't open this. So we used to intravascular lithotripsy balloon, long balloon. Here you can see the constriction gradually releasing. This was the first case of IVL in the state. And uh, uh, finally we got a good result. The whole artery is reconstructed and uh, we got uh, flow up to the foot. Uh, that is a flow from the iliacs down and is, that is kind of the dorsal speed is artery. <laughs> and uh, that is the final, after my final wound healing, he has already lost two toes but he could walk without support. It's another case of non-healing ulcer, post renal transplant, diabetes, normal renal function and uh, the vessel is almost totally occluded with a heavy chunk of calcium, even the wire could not uh, uh, could pass very difficult and again peripheral IVL and uh, uh, that is a final result, a uh, good flow in the SFA and uh, uh, finally a flow uh, up to the foot. And the first case of IVL as well as 4 out of 5 cases of Peripheral intravascular lithotopsy done in our state was done by Team Lake Show. This is another case, non-healing ulcer with diabetes. You can see a, a, a large wound deeply infected 
and uh, again uh, the foot is almost a desert foot, no, no proper flow down. This is after opening the arch formation and the positive artery open. These are very, uh, the, in this case we used bead therapy. So these are very, uh, the beads um, uh, antibiotic integrated, Dr. Johnny will explain in detail. And um, these are the various stages of wound healing, gradually the granulation tissue is coming. This is the final stage of wound healing. So another case, anterior tibial artery uh, diffusely diseased, uh, we have opened with a balloon and uh, um, that is the kind of uh, flow to the foot. So another case, again no positive tibial artery, that is a positive tibial artery opened and the flow to the foot. These are the various stages of the wound healing and finally the, uh, the, the final picture of wound. And for uh, the healing of the wound at sole, good plantar arch formation is important. So uh, this is the kind of uh, poor flow and get the, the gush of blood flow through the branches and that should be a direct blood flow, then only the wound healing will be there. And finally I will, uh, I will impress upon the multidisciplinary team approach including the surgeon, the radiologist and the interventionist and needs feedback and interaction to improve the outcome uh, from, uh, between the team members and uh, how we are able to do uh, these kind of cases. A big thanks to various doctors and departments in EVPS lecture doing a lot of podiatry work. Dr. Joni Kandamli, Dr. Lasse Chandi, Dr. Rajesh Simon and team, Dr. Patma Umar, Dr. Pai and team, Dr. Josh Tarelli, Dr. Abhijit and team and Dr. A.B. Abraham post renal transplant also we get a lot of cases. Thank you. Thank you Dr. A.B. Isaac for that wonderful exposition. Uh, in fact, uh, recently a lot of these uh, vascular revascularizations have been done which improves the uh, blood uh, supply to the lower limb as well as prevent more and more of amputations. We go to the next uh, talk on uh, recent advancement in management of diabetic foot by Dr. Johnny Kanubur. senior colleagues, friends, and uh, chairperson, and my dear speakers along with me. It's an honor to be here in the morning, to be in the symposium. <coughs> I've been given the topic of uh, new advances in diabetic foot management. 80% of the amputations are preceded by foot ulcers. And if you can prevent these foot ulcers from proceeding to major limb-threatening infections or, or problems, we can save many of the foots. An early referral to podiatry speciality is very important. These are the scenes which were there in the medical colleges and government hospitals. Lots of patients lying in the wards, lots of patients lying in the corridors and going for repeated debridings and finally for amputations. And this is when a group of doctors about in the early 80s in all around the world thought that this should not happen as diabetic patients are increasing. They thought that something has to be done about it. And then was a speciality born called podiatry. It was from King's College, Mike Edmonds, Ali Foster, Robert Freiburg and many others all over the world together formed the new speciality called podiatry for new advances and new treatments to reduce the amputations and also mortality in diabetic patients. I was fortunate enough in the early 2000s to be with Mike Edmonds who was one of the pioneers in the podiatry field at King's College London. Well, because of the paucity of time, I'm only going to touch upon a few of the latest developments in the field of diabetic foot. Medical management in PAD is changing. We know the prevalence of PAD, the peripheral vascular disease, is increasing as patients are becoming diabetic at a younger age. Early complications like peripheral vascular disease are increasing. About 29% patients are now recently uh, being found to have peripheral vascular disease. And if you can detect 
the peripheral vascular disease at an early stage, as my previous speaker, Dr. Rahul, showed with angle brachial index. If you can detect peripheral vascular disease at the early stage and then treat it as a medical management, many of these intervascular or uh, angioplasties or bypass surgeries can be prevented and even prevention of amputations to a large extent. I just want to highlight this compass trial, the, the, the role of rivaroxaban in PAD patients. This was a study where rivaroxaban low dose and aspirin in one arm and rivaroxaban in one single arm and another alone aspirin. Uh, well, the study was stopped early because of the uh, overwhelming efficacy of rivaroxaban which was seen in the study. Now, I just want to take you to the subgroup analysis of this trial, the COMPASS trial, in PAD patients. Adding rivaroxaban, that is about 2.5 milligram BD with aspirin, reduced the major adverse cardiovascular events by 28% in severely PVD patients. So they are high risk patients like stroke, MI, cardiovascular death. Well, more than that, what they found was 46% risk reduction, including major amputations, was seen in this group of patients who were having rivaroxaban BD with aspirin. So, you can see that the study concluded that 28% reduction in stroke, CV death and heart attack and 70% reduction in the rate of reduction of amputations in PVD patients. The main thing is it should be detected early and started early in the early course of the peripheral vascular disease. We now switch gears to the next problem in diabetic foot, that is charcoal foot. Well, we know that in diabetic patients, this is there, but uh, about 1% per patients can get diabetic uh, charcoal foot. But as they develop neuropathy, the risk increases by 7%, 7 times. Now, we did a study here and we found that the severe the neuropathy, higher the risk of uh, charcoal disease, higher the biotisiometer, higher the risk of neuro uh, charcoal foot. Monofilament, as Dr. Rahul was saying, if the patient has got high risk foot or loss of sensation, then these are the patients who you should look for and try to prevent from developing charcoal foot. And it is a high risk of suspicion in clinical practice, which we need to detect charcoal at the early stage and then prevent them from proceeding to chronic charcoals. Now the new kid in the block is denosumab that is acting on the parenchyal pathway, which is considered to be the way in which the charcoal foot develops and renosumab this human monoclonal antibody that selectively binds to high affinity, with high affinity to rankle and preventing activation of, the rank, of its rankle receptor on the surface of the osteoclast, resulting in inhibition of any osteoclastic activity and reduction of bone resorption. <coughs> so these are few studies, even though the studies are very early, there are few in numbers, but it's very promising. Uh, this was a study by Bush et al. in 2017 where 22 patients were tried with denosumab single dose injection subcutaneous and there was a fracture resolution and shorter total contact class which is the gold standard treatment time was reduced. Another two studies by Schofter and Carvis, seven patients each, again single dose injections and they found that the acute phase could be shortened by 50 days. And all patients clinically improved. Five patients showed stability of the structural damage and four patients significantly decreased the metabolic activity. And no adverse events were seen or even hypoglycemia was observed. However, we should watch for hypocalcemia. We go to the next development, that is the stimulant, uh, which Dr. Rajesh had just uh, mentioned, is the reabsorbable antibiotic carrier in the management of diabetic foot cases, which is found to be very helpful and very useful 
uh, in reducing the healing time as well as reducing the hospitalization time. It targets high concentration of antibiotic at the point of infection at the level of unachievable systemic, uh, systemically. It lowers the rate of reinfection, saves cost, improves the patient outcomes. And it is only a calcium matrix that can carry the antibiotic to the bone and the soft tissue, offering the surgeons the flexibility to apply a broad spectrum of the shelf antibiotic at concentrations that will support the patient's uh, specific treatment plans. It is truly absorbable, specifically designed to complement your dead space and infection management strategies. So this is how it looks. It is a powder, it comes in powder form, and then you implicate this with a solution which uh, is done to make the beads. It is done in the OPD, which you add also with antibiotic sensi uh, according to the culture sensitivity. And then it is immediately put into this, uh, this mold and it immediately forms into beads. And these beads can be applied to the wound and the patient can be discharged at the earliest. And patient can come to follow up to the OPDs. So it is a patented absorbable calcium matrix, FDA cleared, e European Union approval, all this, and complete resorption in six to eight weeks can be mixed with wide range of antibiotics, and uh, both in powder and liquid form. And non, uh, no non-resorbable impurities that could remain as liners for biofilm formation. So this is just a study where stimulant has shown remarkable benefits in wound healing as well as time of healing. I come to the next um, invention in the management of diabetic food, that is Integra, Dermal Regeneration Template. Well, this is a three-layer, a two-layer, bi-layer membrane, uh, which, is, uh, which helps uh, in places where there are bones is exposed or tendons exposed, where we need flaps, we can prevent, uh, we, in many of the cases we can go hit with this, where we can, uh, you know, go get the healing even without the flaps. So there's a first layer of epidermal layer with silicon and the second layer with type 1 collagen and chondroitin sulfate. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so it's DCGA approved and it's only contraindicated where there's hypersensitivity to this sort of bovine collagen. And it can be used in, apart from the EDF use, many other situations also. The founder trial, the replacement study, where they evaluated in a randomized controlled trial in diabetic food patients. And they found that excellent wound healing closure compared to the standard therapy. The green is the in integra, and the gray is the standard therapy. And here you have three times higher uh, odds of complete closure and 59% increase complete closure and 50% faster healing and 5 weeks faster healing. So 100% reepithelization of the wound surface after silicone removal and uh, um, you know the, there's no grafting required. So these are just a few uh, photographs of a few of the cases just to show you. A wonderful healing. Now come to my last uh, partner of the in new inventions, that is the um, sterile, uh, minimally manipulated, dehydrated human amniotic chorion membrane allograft, which restores wound bed physiology while supporting natural healing of acute and chronic wounds. And it's called the Amcoplus, is the by life cell. They are the ones who brought it out. It's from the placenta, and there are even sheets and powders. And this is the powder form. Well, a natural skin substitute derived from the human placenta is also uh, acts as a biological barrier membrane, rich in multiple extracellular matrix proteins, contains more than 200 cytokines, chemokines, growth factors present in the human placental tissue, provides matrix, retains biological activities that support cell proliferation and migration. Non-immunogenic, ready to use, easy to handle, bioabsorbable, does not require Thoi, ability to modulate inflammation, enhance wound healing, and reduce pain and scar tissue formation. This is just to show you that increased granulation, increased keratinocyte and fibrocyte activity helps remove viable tissue as well. This is just to show you over silver dressings. This has found to be uh, excellent dressing to foster healing 
and lesser healing time. This is just a few cases just to show you the benefit after using this. These are just excellent wound healing with this molecule. So the take home message is evaluation of, uh, sorry, the, ev the evolution of podiatry as a speciality as a new branch in the medicine has helped to do research and development and bring about new treatments and reduce amputations in diabetic patients by 80%. New advancement like rivaroxaban in PVD, denosumab in acute charcoal foot and others will further improve the outcomes of diabetic patients. But early referral to a podiatry speciality and the multidisciplinary uh, team as mentioned by Dr. C.D. and others is very important to achieve good outcomes in diabetic patients. This is an audit done about, about I think, five, seven years back. I have not taken the recent audit. And we found that in our hospital, we've got 85% limbs saved to our center. This is not just by myself alone, by the team. As we go, I should acknowledge, I, otherwise I'll be failing, that cardiology, orthopedics, anesthesiology, nephrology, microbiology, radiology, plastic surgery, all have shifted to get this excellent result, 85% world standard results. I think one of the pioneer centers in the state as well as in the country to give this kind of results in the, team, in the field of podiatry. Thanks to all the team members who chipped in for this excellent work. I should also mention that our diabetic foot nightingales also played a major role. These are the trained diabetic foot nurses who do excellent sterile dressings, which are very important to prevent reinfection and cross infection in patients. They are trained to do that so that excellent wound healing is achieved without causing much problems. So this is the end of my slide. This was some years back when uh, E.K. Nayanar, our ex-chief minister, was taken from one of the government medical college from here, taken to Delhi Ames with heel ulcer. And unfortunately, he lost his life from the complication of diabetes, leading to um, septicemia and death. Well, this picture gives us two messages. One, diabetic and diabetic foot cut across all sections of the people. It can be educated, it can be rich, poor, uneducated. Any section of the people can be affected with diabetic foot. The message is that you have to refer to the right center at the earliest to achieve uh, walking foot to left to your patients as well as save their lives. Well, maybe if he was referred to Lake Show, well, maybe he would have been so He would be still living, I guess. God knows. With that, I end my talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Jironi, for uh, uh, taking us through the entire journey of this medical and uh, topical therapy. I think uh, very, very nicely done. I still remember uh, when I joined 2005, uh, this was the first time I had a dedicated lower extremity amputation prevention leap center in Lakeshore. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Now uh, I met uh, for the final uh, lecture Dr. Rajesh Simon, the uh, charcoal uh, foot disease. It's uh, management and the Lakeshore uh, experience. You all know this is a slightly different from uh, the diabetic foot. It's a physiology as well as treatment is very different and. Uh, uh, Dr. Rajesh has an excellent uh, uh, experience and uh, he is very interested in this uh, uh, disease. We will hear from Dr. Rajesh. Thank you, Dr. Anand, respected chairpersons, MD, DMS, and all the senior faculties and friends. Uh, I had actually asked a few months back to Arun to, uh, to take up this particular topic of diabetic foot on with a multidisciplinary approach, because this is what we have in the world standards about the diabetic foot. And we heard so many good things about the, how we have taken care of a lot of diabetic patients, diabetic foot patients, over a period of few years. And this has been an enigma when it comes to the sharp foot. 
and uh, most of the seniors would uh, you know, look at this particular, uh, they'll know, except for the few new guys who are this, that this is the one of, once upon a time, the slapstick comedies, kings, the Lauren Hardy. I always look at the diabetic foot in the two ways. To keep it simple, you know, orthopedic surgeons are never too, too medically, and like an endocrinologist, we can never be good, too good in medical, so we keep things in simple way. So we have diabetic foot in two ways, the avascular way and the hypovascular way. And that is how I look at it, and that is what we've been look, hearing about the avascular part, the, the, the cardiology, uh, the interventional area, vascular part, the medicines, and now Dr. Johnny talked about the hypervascular medications about the denosumab. But then is that enough is a question. And we also have a common friend in the, the neuropathic which actually creates the most biggest problem because this creates the loss of uh, the, the sensation, peripheral sensation, LOPS what we call it and make, makes the life difficult for both physicians and uh, the, the treating uh, doctor. So why is it important for us today? Today, we in India are about looking at 49% of diabetic uh, patients world over. So we are probably the world's capital in diabetes. And in that 49% in Kerala, there has been a study which says that about 8 to 9 percentage convert into sharp foot. Pan India, it is about 5 to 9 percentage. We are talking about a population of more than Scandinavian countries like uh, countries like Denmark, Finland. That is the amount of patients having sharp foot foot. So we really have to understand, we really have to treat them early, otherwise as one of the first talks Rahul was saying, we are looking at a mortality rate of more than 50 percentage, which is much more than any cancer in uh, which would lead in a five-year mortality rate is what we are talking about in a diabetic foot patients or a sharp foot patients. So looking at a swelling, when you have a patient coming to you with a history of diabetes, with swelling around the foot, which is not so painless, then it could be a beginning of Sharko. Just try and send the patient to the radiology department. You would be surprised that there is a fracture sitting there and you would not recognize because patient has been happily walking around with a swollen up foot. So next time when you see a patient, diabetic patient with swelling for a few days or few months, please take an x-ray. It really is helpful. Because Charcot is a relatively painless, progressive degenerative arthropathy involving multiple joints of the foot and with a neurological deficit. So there is no pain in this patient. So this is the problem. This is why the patient is happily walking around in spite of having multiple fractures. And the treating this type of swollen up foot in an acute stage as cellulitis, this is which is like it looks like cellulitis, so we treat this patient as cellulitis, but this treating like this is treating like these two tummies in the same way. We cannot treat these two causes in the same way because there are an absolutely different reasons of this. So we have to understand that sharp foot foot and cellulitis is an absolutely different cause. You cannot treat it at the same way. So diagnosis this at the first stage. We have non-specific investigations, x-rays, MRI and bone scans are also helpful in getting the diagnosis, but they are not specific. You cannot identify them with the, 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 the infection. So it is more of a clinical examination that actually looks uh, to you in, in, in diagnosis of an acute shock. This is one of our own patients who came to us when I was starting foot and ankle about six years back, five or six years back if I remember. This patient came to me and why is it important is to diagnose at this stage is see if you look at it the x-rays are reasonably normal but then being a foot and ankle surgeon I found there was some kind of small thing there foot was swollen up and I said you need a plaster but the 
treating physician who was not from here but from outside the hospital said, oh, this is cellulitis, don't bother about it, just it's okay. <coughs> the patient comes back to me in two years' time and this is the foot. What we saw, that small fragment there is still there, but the foot is completely collapsed, the midfoot is completely disorganized, few of the bones have been eaten up. So this is what the difference is. If you remember, if you see this patient at early stage, and then if you see the same patient at late stage, this catastrophe has happened, which could have been prevented. So diagnosis in the early stage, what we call as the Eichenholz classification of stage zero, is very important. And each one of you today have a role of diagnosing this in the early stage. This is not cellulitis. Treat it with this and simple, uh, you can see. So this is how it collapses, if you look at it, the whole bony structure collapses because of the, the hyperglycemia, the, the, uh, the osteoclastic effect, and all that which we have already heard. Medical management till the advent of denosumab was not beneficial. We have not got anything, though parmidronate has been said, but we really do not have any, any study. Denosumab is early stage, let's hope it helps. We've also started in few of the cases but it's too early to kind of say. So medical management till now has not been very beneficial. What has been beneficial is just putting a plaster. Without absolutely no medicines, what you need is, a, I mean, of course, sugar control, but plaster helps in early stages. And that is what we all have to identify. This is where you have to diagnose and this is where you can treat this patient. But and then you can put something like this called, uh, called the crow or the sharp foot restraining orthotic walker and help the patient to move around. But what happens is here when we get our patients, this is how they come with. And let me tell you friends, these are not Google pictures. These are our own pictures which has come to our own OPD, either by a wheelchair, walking or uh, on the trolley. Number of people in this particular picture have been advised amputation by number of professors around the medical college and they have somehow they reached here. So I'll just pick up five cases of this and show you. This is one of this 56 year old lady who underwent law of treatment, came with Ayurveda at last at last and last it was advised amputation because this was going on for two years. And so when we took the picture, uh, we saw the patient, sent for an x-ray, we found actually the tarsal metatarsal area, uh, the intermetatarsal uh, area was completely dislocated and that is why the rock bottom foot was uh, given. So then we took her up, debrided the wound in a staged manner, got the wound healed and then fixed it up. Now you can see the whole arch has come out and what was that? to start with has completely turned to a normal feed. Just understanding the biomechanics, understanding the diabetic, understanding the, uh, the, the way it heals, the, the whole leg, the quality of life of this particular patient from what it was has changed to this. Now we have, you can look at a near normal looking foot. Yes, it is still neuropathic, it is still numb, but she can walk. Next case. This is a, uh, a diabetic patient with 12 years history, again a non-healing ulcer, difficulty in walking, no respite of ulcer and patient was continuously changing the footwears and all that and this wound would not heal. This picture is unfortunately after one and a half or two months of total contact cast, the wound looks healed now and we you, you get an x-ray, you will really understand why this healing is not happening because this is the cuboid, what we are looking at, the circle one, is completely dislocated in the plantar aspect. And the cuboid is the, is the pressure sore that is actually causing the ulcer. It is not because of the diabetes, it is not because of, no, uh, of, the, of the vascularity problem here. It is the pressure ulcer which leads to this particular problem. And you just have to offload that. but we have we are uh, offloaded in a different way not with the footwear and what was a foot there before and look at the foot now you have the arch developed the broadness of the foot has come down you have the foot completely normal 
And this is uh, the picture one year back, but this is actually now we have a photo of this same patient for three years now. And three years he is walking completely normal, absolutely no, no problem. Yes, diabetes is still there, neuropathy continues, but he is walking. Third case, this is a act fracture ankle patient, treated elsewhere with plaster. The but the HbA1c was around 11, not realized, and it completely disarrayed. So as Rahul said, first day, this hyperglycemia actually leads to catabolism, high osteoclastic activity, and that is the reason in ankle fracture in diabetic we treat it differently. And this was the effect. The whole bone was completely eaten up, and we uh, had to do what we call as the tibio talo fusion, and look at it, her, you, she doesn't have an ankle joint, she doesn't have a subtalar joint, but look at her, how she walks. And this is how a normal people can walk, in a, um, because and this is how this, she is walking, and this is one of her first cases of sharp foot foot. This is, I think, almost five years follow-up now. This was one challenging case, completely uh, uh, disintegrated foot and ankle both. And if you look at this particular x-rays, you see there is absolutely no calcanium was eaten up partially. The talus was partially eaten up. The, the cuboids was hardly there. The navicular completely destroyed. So this was a picture and this was a foot which she came with. Again, she was walking with pain and impending ulcer. This was actually what the picture was. So we go on again after all the um, the, the, the sugar controls, the uh, all those medical uh, fit. We go and fix her up. And what we saw her to last when we preoperatively came. This is how she was walking, miserably walking, and uh, completely dislocating ankle. And this is how she walks now. Look at the difference of confidence level. Look at her, how she's walking and how she was before. So you have to understand the complete change of quality of life of these patients when they, when they undergo such type of treatment. The last case, uh, this was an RB patient who came with an absolutely uncontrolled diabetes and this was the foot. Somebody had incised saying that diabetic, this is infection, it became infectious because of the surgery and he was pouring pus and now if you look at the x-ray you can find how it was. There is hardly any talus. The calcaneum is maybe there somewhat. The half of the mid tarsals is completely gone and uh, absolutely uncontrolled diabetes. Our endocrinologists worked hard <coughs> The good thing about sharp foot foot in most of the patients is they have got good vascularity. And so we go on to do debridements and during the debridements we could take out few more tarsals which was lying free and uh, you can see the amount of pus that is exuding out. So we take this in a staged manner, did a couple of debridements and then what as uh, Dr. Johnny showed uh, some stimulant. We do something in a little more different way when it comes to medullary way. So we use an antibiotic coated nail and we got the wound healed completely. And that patient, we, we, I went for it, I thought I'll do a staged thing, did this hind foot nailing, said we'll do the midfoot reconstruction later on. But this guy has never come back um, uh, and this is what he sends. The review is through WhatsApp videos. And this is how he shows to me every six to eight months he shows, sends a video and this is how it is. Two years now, this was during the corona time, early corona time, he was getting treated here and look at the happiness which he has with a patient who does not, did not have a talus, he did not have a calcanium and hardly some of the tarsals remaining. So this is how we go. Is the surgery safe? No, absolutely not. If this is my own patient, I don't deny that this is my own patient, this was my uh, sharp foot failure. This is how I learned from being an orthopedic surgeon, this is how an orthopedic surgeon would fix, but this is not how it should be fixed in a sharp foot foot. So when I fixed this as an orthopedic surgeon, it failed, 
and then we had to, to do a different way to salvage the limb. Amputation is an absolutely not a good choice because the function of an amputee is absolutely poor and the five-year mortality in bilateral amputee goes as high as 60 per So you have to understand, amputation is absolutely not an answer for a diabetic Charcot patient. And we have to stand together with multidisciplinary approach to save this, this limbs and save life. As of today, we have had 89 patients treated by us successfully and not one has been amputated. And all the stories are a similar pattern to what you've saw, seen in these five patients. We had uh, last number with the help of IMD, we had a uh, uh, get together of few of our Sharpwood patients and we also have a late show Sharpwood support group to all our patients who come and we the patients themselves educate each other because more than us telling them, they were the ones, they are the ones who actually tell, share their grievances and, uh, and come to us and make our team much more bigger. So to conclude, please understand Sharpwood Arthropathy, please do not uh, leave it as cellulitis, deserves a better attention. Multidisciplinary approach of diabetic foot, of diabetes, and sharp wood is absolutely necessary. Prevention, as Johnny was saying, we could have prevented something with even, even up to Ikenaina's way. Prevention in early stages is very important. Bony causes are a reason for sharp wood. So when you see a uh, swelled up foot, take an x-ray. It, it, it is not much costly. Surging vocal intervention at right time and the patient gets a plantic rate, normal looking foot. Thank you very much for your patience. That comes to the end of our uh, session. Uh, all of them have uh, <coughs> uh, done, given due justice to their topics and put them into a capsule of uh, diabetic foot and given us to swallow. Now, if you have any doubts regarding any particular um, point, you can raise it. So, uh, so this is just a comment on uh, bisphosphonates and the denosumab that this is in show. Uh, see, we have to remember that uh, the bisphosphonate, like what I said, the only proper trial was done in 2001. This is the only randomized double blind trial that was done by Pamitronate, by Dr. Jude and Andrew Bodenstein. After that, there has never been any trials, randomized controlled trials with bisphosphonates. The negative uh, aspect of bisphosphonates comes from two aspects. So there is a systemic review which came in 2012, which said it could, uh, it is not really useful, but it has used all the trials that is, uh, you know, that did not, uh, that is not proper, that is not properly designed. Then the second aspect is that, um, you know, there is this very small uh, observational study which said the healing time or the uh, cast time with uh, uh, saltonic acid may be slightly delayed. This is the two negative aspects about uh, bisphosphonates, but I feel more evidence is required there. The second aspect is with regard to denosumab. Again, um, it is very interesting because, you know, the rank uh, is one of the most common upregulated things in charcoal food. But um, denosumab is probably the most potent non-suppressant of the rank they had. But then it is so potent, technically you may get a rebound. That is something that we face in osteoporosis. You use it for two to three times and then you stop it, you can get rebound fractures, right? So all the trials that has been shown, again, there are no RCTs again, few observational studies. In that particular study with uh, 22 patients, six of them failed. And I just should remember, we have used denosumab in few patients. But if you're using it for more than two times or three times, I'd be really cautious uh, because we need to follow up these patients as to what happens to them. So it's relatively early and uh, definitely please do a, a BMD also when you're giving denosumab because when you suddenly stop, you can cause rebound vertebral fractures. So I'm a little cautious. It's very promising, but I'm really cautious if you are really using it more than two to three times here. Yeah. Yeah, sure. First, I would like to address uh, what Dr. Vivek was saying. Um, 
I think tamidronate and calcitonin, I think slowly is going out of uh, the treatment in charcoal food because not much of evidence have shown promising results with uh, this uh, pamidronate or the bisphosphonates and calcitonin. Compared to that, um, this denosumab, even though the trials as Vivek was saying, it's a very early stage treatment, is showing promise. But definitely we have to keep in mind the hypocalcemia, which can be a problem and it may be worthwhile to give um, calcium supplements as well. Well, it's too early, but it's promising. Um, to Dr. Uh, Sir's question regarding the cost, regarding the cost, the stimulants cost around roughly, uh, the, the peak costs about 20,000 roughly. Um, and extra is the, uh, the antibiotic cost. But you can reduce the hospitalization uh, in patients. You can, uh, as soon as the wound deprivement is over and as soon as you feel uh, the active infection is less, they can, you can immediately put the bead and send them home. It will take care of the infection as well as the wound healing. So that way, the cost, overall cost, is cost burden has reduced. Second, regarding the uh, the Amcoplus, it's not very really expensive. So that is the human chorionic thing. It's uh, roughly around 1,500, and it's found to be very effective for wound healing. The the, the Integra is a little expensive. It's around uh, I don't remember, but uh, it's about uh, I think the plastic surgeons would be able to say. Around uh, 90%. Yeah, it's a little expensive, but it can it should be reserved to patients who uh, has bone exposures or who have uh, tendon exposures. In such patients, only you require this, and it's also found to be very, very effective in managing such cases where sometimes flap surgeries can be also avoided. And rivaroxaban also is quite. Um, uh, it is expensive, but then when you consider the benefit, it's really good. But all these depends on early detection, early intervention to get the best results. Thank you. Uh, what is the role of this uh, topical growth factors? Amchoplus is actually, Amchoplus is actually uh, this uh, plurmin creams and all, yes, all, all those are uh, the... the what I actually, uh, I mean, yes, all these topical things are helpful only if you have good vascularity. So, interventional vascular is, I think, is very important more than all these costly drugs. We have to get the blood to get the healing. Without blood, there is absolutely no problem way we can heal. So, all these topicals are there, but only if you have blood. So, vascularity is very important. So I think the emphasis of most all these places will have all this uh, play, uh, all these drugs and all these topicals. But what many people do not realize is why the blood circulation is less, and that is where we have to do an angiogram to identify. Even Doppler at times have been in uh, missed many a times. An angiogram is actually helpful, and that is where we can uh, treat most of the diabetic ulcers. Dr. Siddhi, one just question because uh, uh, I think the Dr. Rahul showed a slide that the mortality of diabetic foot is actually more than cancers. And I feel most, uh, almost 80 percent of this mortality is not due to the ulcer but because most of them die of heart, MI, myocardial infarction. Because almost 85 percent of them have severe CAD. So, uh, it's very important to evaluate the CAD. Uh, Dr. Siddhi, would like to Actually, peripheral arterial disease is a marker of coronary artery disease. Uh, the earliest vessels to be affected by atherosclerosis is coronaries and the last vessels to be affected is peripheral arteries. So, once the peripheral artery is affected, most of the time at least 40 to 50 percent they will be having coronary artery disease. And the mortality, the, uh, the peripheral work is a quality of life while mortality is mainly due to the cor associated coronary artery disease. So, sometimes we combine with angiograms and we 
uh, inform them and we have to correct them also uh, for decreasing mortality. Yeah, I think I just want to second Dr. Rajesh and Dr. CB on those lines. First of all, it's very important to assess the vascularity of any diabetic foot who walks into your clinic. Do an ankle brachial index. If it's below 0.6, then definitely you need to refer to the vascular specialist who can do, like for us, Dr. C.B. and Anand have been doing an excellent job and uh, do an angiogram and proceed for the uh, angioplasty or bypass surgery. Uh, so that's very important as Dr. Rajesh was saying. Secondly, which I would like to say is that because of the paucity of time, I could not show the research work we have done. What we have found is that uh, any patient who is admitted for diabetic foot, if there is peripheral vascular disease, we make sure that um, we also work up for the coronary artery disease. As Dr. Sibi was rightly saying, any, we did a study where patients came for diabetic foot, they had no symptoms of any cardiovascular disease. And then we circum them as they were going for a peripheral angiogram. We put them for also a coronary angiogram and they found that the patients who had severe the peripheral vascular disease, severe the coronary artery disease. And the most important thing is many a times patients come with a small wound and they get admitted for the wound and suddenly if they develop a coronary artery disease and die, then the relatives are so much uh, you know, agitated. They, they think that it's because of the uh, work or the medicines or something which triggered the coronary event, but it's otherwise. So it's always better to assess the coronary uh, vascular problems as well along while treating the diabetic foot because otherwise you'll be missing a major problem. So it is in, it is coexistent. Thank you. And regarding your question regarding the growth factors like plurmin and others, initially yes, uh, these are um, growth factors where you can get, there are two types of growth factors and both are beneficial where to get the wound closed. But with this new uh, human chorionic thing, I found this is much more effective and much more uh, beneficial. Uh, one doubt to Dr. George. You said that minimum dose of rivaroxaban that is uh, 2.5 milligram along with aspirin. Is it for uh, preventing the vascularities or I didn't get that. Yeah, that's from the COMPASS trial where uh, they did a, the main study was to find the cardiovascular events, whether the major maze, major acute coronary events could be reduced. And they found that there was a major reduction in stroke, coronary events, etc. But in the subgroup analysis of peripheral vascular disease, where they found that even the amputations were reduced by around 40% and around 70 per, sorry 70 percent amputation so what uh, if we can detect early coronary i mean early peripheral vascular disease and give a low dose maybe in the future we'll be able to try we are doing a trial seeing whether we can uh, reverse the, the the peripheral vascular disease in these patients where minimal like anything between an ankle break index between 0.8 and uh, 0.6 is a mild to moderate peripheral vascular disease and you don't need actually to go for an angiogram or an angioplasty the wound can heal by itself but below 0.6 we have to go for an angiogram angioplasty if the wound has to heal these stages of the peripheral vascular disease of mild to moderate these rivaroxabans may be helpful to slow the progression or even reverse the progression so, uh, if there are no further uh, questions, uh, we will conclude this session.